It is also my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight. Dr. Stephen Horowitz is a Charles A. Dana Professor of Economics at St. Lawrence University in New York. He is the author of two books, Micro Foundations and Mi Macroeconomics, an Austrian Perspective, and Monetary Evolution, Free Banking, and Economic Order, and he has written extensively on Austrian economics, Iacian political economy, monetary theory, and history, and the economics and social theory of gender and the family. A member of the Mont Pelerin Society, he completed his MA and PhD in economics at George Mason University and received his AB in <coughs> economics and philosophy from the University of Michigan. Professor Horwitz is a huge pro hockey fan, especially of his beloved Detroit Red Wings. Please welcome Dr. Professor Horwitz. Not, not, not only did my table erupt in booze at the mention of Detroit Red Wings, what, what Rick doesn't know well, is that actually the puck had dropped about 10 minutes ago on their opening Stanley Cup game. So my opportunity cost tonight is very, very high. <laughs> um, Thank, first of all, thank you all for having me. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here. Uh, as I was telling a number of you, I've been here since Sunday for the Association of Private Enterprise Education meetings, which are up the road at the Sheridan. It's my first time uh, in the Bahamas, and it's been lovely. I'm taking the weather home with me. Sorry. Uh, and so again, I, I, it's, it's really, it's really a pleasure to be here. I've had a great time. I uh, did some TV yes, yesterday, two days ago, <laughs> two days, I can't remember what day it is anymore. Two days ago, I did some radio today and had a great time uh, doing all that as well. So it, it really has been a pleasure. Um, what I'm going to talk about tonight is, is uh, the, my topic is three contemporary economic myths. And uh, what all of these deal with, what they all have in common in a way, is that they're all uh, myths about the sort of the question of whether the world is getting better or not. And we have, uh, there is, I think, a pervasive uh, uh, story in the media and among some academics as well, that, that the world is getting uh, worse and worse and worse and, and, and everything is going to the heck in a handbasket. Um, and, and we see this in the form of the three myths that I'm going to talk about tonight, all three of which sort of suggest that there's bad things happening out there. And what, I'm, what I hope to do tonight is to suggest that each of these three myths are, in fact, myths. And I should say from the start that every myth, of course, has a kernel of truth to it, right? That's why we accept it as a myth. So part of what I'm going to do is sort of indicate what the kernel of truth is and then talk about why the way we usually hear these three propositions framed are, are in fact, uh, mistaken. I, I want to make two general comments about this. I've been doing this talk in one form or another for about a decade. And and the interesting part is, is that, as, it, as you'll see tonight, it's like an archaeological dig a bit because I keep adding sort of more and more recent data. And I'm going to put up actually quite a bit of data up here tonight. So I keep adding more and more recent data to, to sort of continue to make sure that I'm not just dealing with, with old information, uh, including something that appeared in the Wall Street Journal a week ago that I snuck in at the last minute when I was putting the, the PowerPoint together. Um, so you'll see a range of data here. The other thing, that I, now that I've done this talk a couple times in the last couple of years, I have to sort of bring, to make a general point about the recession. All of the things I'm going to talk about tonight are what I would call medium to long term trends, right? These are not, you know, it's, it will be, I'm happy to take this question afterwards, but the sort of uh, question of what's been the impact since, say, 2007 on some of the, the three things I'm going to talk about tonight, particularly the first two, I think is a legitimate question, and we can talk about that. But it doesn't, I don't think the uh, impact of the recession changes my argument, because my argument ultimately is a kind of long-term, what economists would call a secular, meaning a long-term long -term trend. So let me just kind of put that out on the table, as a, and so as, as you're listening tonight, if you start thinking, well, you know, okay, maybe that was true a few years ago, but it's not true. You know, my busting of the myth is not true any, anymore. We can, that's certainly a good set of questions to think about in the Q&A. So I'm going to talk, I think, for about 45 minutes, which will probably take you through dinner, maybe to dessert. Um, as you see, I recommend dessert highly. The chocolate mousse is wonderful. So if you're, my, my father actually goes to restaurants and asks to see the dessert menu first so he can backward engineer the rest of his meal, right? So if it's a really good dessert, then i got to make it. So it's a really good dessert tonight. So plan accordingly. Okay, 
Um, so my three, the three myths, you can go ahead and click and put all three on there. Here are the three myths I want to address tonight. Um, the first myth is that the cost of living rose steadily throughout the 20th century, and we could add the first decade of the 21st. Well, the second myth is that the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. And the third myth is that women earn 74 cents for every dollar. Men, that men do. All three of these I want to argue tonight, again, have that kernel of truth to them. But in the bigger picture, they are all false. They're all myths that, that, we, that many people tend to believe about the economy. I guess I should make one other point here, too, talking to an audience here in the Bahamas. As you'll see, all my data is U.S. data. And frankly, for two reasons. One, that's where these myths are most often, you know, most often talked about. Second, that's where the best data is. Um, as far as I know, all the things I'm going to say tonight are true, perhaps not to the same extent, but true for Canada and for most of Western Europe. So this is a, this is a kind of, this is a, uh, not just U.S. sort of, the, 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 the moral of the story is not just U.S., it is uh, true of the developed world. I think the question of what we now, what we would say about the lesser developed world is an interesting set of questions we can talk about as well. So, okay. So first myth, the cost of living rose steadily over the course of the 20th century. Now, why would we believe this? Well, the obvious reason we might believe this is we simply look at the prices of uh, the goods we buy at the grocery store or at the, at, the, you know, at the department store, and clearly those numbers are higher than they used to be. And, you know, those of you who are old enough to remember when candy bars cost 10 cents, now they cost a dollar, we said, of course it's more expensive to live now than it was uh, you know, 25, 50 years ago. There's two problems with that sticker price argument, though. The, the lesser problem, of course, is inflation. Okay? That, there's no doubt that prices across the board are higher, right? because we've had a growth, growth in the money supply and inflation, certainly since World War II. Uh, and because of that, it's also the case that our wages are higher than they used to be. Right? If you ask, you, know, you can ask my, my parents, your parents, what, you know, what kind of, I know what my dad's first job, he was a college professor also, out of when he got his first job teaching uh, at university with four kids was a number of that, I just gasped, how do you support four kids on that in the mid-1960s? But you did, right? Because prices were lower and wages were lower. So part of the story why it looks like this is true is that everything's gotten more expensive, but some of that's due to inflation. But that's actually not the major point I want to make. The major point I want to make is that when we talk about the standard of living, the cost of living, what we really need to talk about is the amount of labor it takes to purchase goods and services. Because ultimately, the most, the most scarce commodity in our lives is the time we have, right? And we only have 80 years, we only have so many hours in a day. So the more hours we have to work to purchase goods, the more expensive they are in some fu fundamental sense. And if it's the case that we spend less, we, we have to spend less of our labor to purchase goods, our standard of living is higher. And so one of the things we can do is we can compute how much labor time it takes to buy at, at the average industrial or average private sector wage to compute, to compute how much labor time it would take to purchase a, a, a sort of general array of, of, goods, of goods and services. So for example, okay, a pair of pants might, might, if a pair of pants costs $20, but the average private sector wage is $2 an hour, it's taking people 10 hours to purchase, of labor to purchase those pants. But if the average private sector wage is $10 an hour, it's only taking two hours of our lives to purchase, to purchase those pants. What we're going to see in a minute is that for a wide variety, many goods and services are substantially cheaper now than they have been in the past when looked at, when looked at this way. And the, the reason for this is that for a lot of goods, uh, rich folks pay the big upfront cost by buying these goods when they're very expensive. Think of any technology advance in the last decade, right? Who were the first people to buy flat screen TVs or, or iPhones or, or you know, whatever the case may be? People with more money 